A Guide to Growing Cauliflower A member of the Brassica family, cauliflower is packed with vitamin C. Though the white curd of the cauliflower is most typically consumed, its leaves and stems are also edible. Cauliflower has emerged as a versatile replacement veggie, forming pizza crusts, bagels, and rice. Cauliflower Varieties White cauliflower varieties include Snowball, Snow Crown, Skywalker, and Marty. This variety has the most widely known whiteheads, along with big leaves to wrap around for blanching. Broccoflower varieties include Veronica and Punto Verde. These are a hybrid between broccoli and cauliflower, and they're greenish in color with geometric florets. Graffiti is a cauliflower variety with a purple head that usually loses its color during cooking. Orange varieties include Cheddar and Flame Star. These types have yellow to orange flower heads, which become even more intense in color when cooked. Green varieties include Vita Verde and Verdi, and these types have big green heads that mature early. Fioretto is a variety that's bred to have long, narrow stems with small white florets on the top. This variety is sweeter than regular cauliflower and has a crunchy texture. To germinate, seedlings prefer a soil temperature that's between 50 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 to 29 degrees Celsius, though they can germinate at soil temperatures as low as 40 degrees Fahrenheit, 4 degrees Celsius. Provide direct sunlight when seedlings start growing, otherwise the plants can get leggy when stems are too long and scraggly. Seedlings need about 14 hours of light each day. Cauliflower seeds will also need about 4 to 6 weeks to grow to their transplanting size. Once they're ready, transplants can be set into the garden. Keep the transplants 15 to 24 inches, 38 to 61 centimeters apart, in rows that are 2 to 3 feet, 61 to 91 centimeters apart. Seeds can also be started directly outside once the temperatures are reliably staying above 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius. Plant the seeds a half to 3 quarters of an inch, 1.2 to 1.9 centimeters deep and spaced about three inches, 7.6 centimeters apart. Once they have three to four true leaves, the seedlings can be thinned to be 12 to 18 inches, 30 to 45 centimeters apart. Cauliflower prefers soils that have a pH between 6.0 to 7.0, and they also need consistent and sufficient soil moisture. Full sun is best for them to grow, but cauliflower can also tolerate some light shade. Cauliflower plants prefer air temperatures between 68 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit, 20 to 25 degrees Celsius, and grow best when temperatures do not go above 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius. In hot and dry weather, typically their edible heads won't develop. Delayed spring plantings can often expose cauliflower plants to these hot temperatures. As well, any disruption by extreme cold can also negatively affect their heads, since cauliflower is more sensitive to cold than other cabbage family members. To preserve the white head of cauliflower, secure the leaves with a rubber band or string around the head when it's about 3 inches, 7.6 centimeters in diameter, about the size of a hen's egg. It protects the white portion from sunburn and prevents the edible part from turning green and developing a bad flavor. Some varieties are actually self-blanching and have the tendency to curl their leaves over the head. The blanching process is only necessary with white varieties, since colored ones need the sun to become purple, orange, or green. Weeding Cauliflower plants have a shallow root system, so avoid cultivating or weeding as much as possible. Fertilizer Work one to two pounds of a complete fertilizer, like 10 to 20 to 12 per 100 square feet, nine meters squared, into the first two to three inches, five to 7.6 centimeters of soil. About two to four inches of well-composted organic matter can also be applied to the soil before planting. About four weeks after transplanting or thinning, apply a half cup per 10 feet, three meters of row, using a nitrogen-based fertilizer. Place it six inches next to each plant, then water it into the soil, which is a process called side dressing. Mulch. Straw, 
wood chips, or grass clippings can be added to the plants when temperatures rise above 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 26 degrees Celsius. This will cool down the soil, reduce water stress, and control any weeds around the plants. Only transplant once the soil has warmed up to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius, and the seedlings have four to five true leaves. Typically, it takes about five to six weeks of growing transplants indoors before they're ready to go into the garden. Developing transplants should be fertilized two times a week with a 20 to 20 to 20 soluble fertilizer. Before transplanting, cauliflower plants will need to be hardened off. Start moving them outside roughly three to four days before transplanting into a sheltered spot. This will toughen them up and get them used to outside conditions, which can help limit their shock and prevent premature head growth. Cauliflower can be planted with beans, beets, carrots, celery, and onions. As well, it can be companion planted with herbs like dill, mint, rosemary, and sage. Strawberries, peppers, tomatoes, and squash are all adversaries of cauliflower. Raised beds. These are a great option to improve soil drainage while also having a higher soil temperature than the actual ground. Raised beds help prevent the spread of certain diseases that thrive in cool and or moist conditions, which is great for cauliflower plants. Containers. Containers and pots can also be an option, but they need to be big enough to accommodate the whole plant. They should be at least eight inches in diameter per plant at the top. They'll also need holes in the bottom to allow for good water drainage. Open field. With this option, cauliflower has the most space to grow. First, the soil should be checked for its fertilizer needs, as well as any possible disease infection before planting. Usually with open fields, plants don't need to be watered as regularly as with container plants. Cabbage aphids. Small green or black insects that are also covered in a white waxy coating. Cabbage aphids feed on the undersides of leaves, causing them to curl and crinkle. Large numbers of these pests can stunt the growth of plants or even kill the plants entirely. Here's what to do. If aphid numbers are limited to just a few leaves, then the cabbage aphid infestation can be pruned out. Be sure to check transplants for aphids before planting and use tolerant varieties when possible. Reflective mulches, like silver plastic, can also help deter aphids from feeding on plants. Any sturdy plants can be sprayed with a strong jet of water to knock aphids off, while insecticides are only needed if the infestation is very high. In general, plants can tolerate low to medium level infestations. Insecticidal soaps or oils, like neem or canola oil, are usually the best method of control. Just be sure to check their labels for instructions. Cabbage Root Maggot. These maggots feed on the roots of plants, creating tunnels, and can actually destroy the whole root system, which impacts a plant's nutrient uptake and support. The first signs of damage from these pests are the wilting of plants in hot weather, or the yellowing or purpling of a plant's leaves. Later on, plants will collapse and can die completely. Unfortunately, once the damage from root maggots is noticed, it's usually too late to treat the maggot problem. Here's what to do. Practice crop rotation and avoid applying animal manure or green manure during the springtime, since rotting and decaying organic matter will attract these maggots. Be sure to remove any affected plants in the fall, including their roots, and destroy them. This will kill any maggots that might be left over. Row covers are also an effective option to help prevent adult flies from getting near plants to lay their eggs. Just be sure to set up the barrier by the time adult flies are laying eggs. Keep in mind too that it's best to choose a barrier that allows both sunlight and rain to get to the plants. Because of this, floating row covers might not be the best option for large gardens. 
Common organic cures for root maggot include spreading diametaceous earth, a natural powder made from the skeletons of tiny aquatic creatures around seedlings, or using natural predators like spiders, ground beetles, and rove beetles to fend them off. In some cases, intercropping with clovers or legumes can also be helpful in limiting maggot infestations. Cabbage worm. This caterpillar is gray-green in color and slightly fuzzy. After it eats the leaves of plants, it leaves holes and wet green droppings behind. Here's what to do. Hand pick cabbage worms if you find them on any plants. There are also natural enemies like spiders, ground beetles, and parasitic wasps that will feed on these cabbage worms, which can be an effective and organic solution. Also, weeds attract and shelter these pests, so it's important to keep weed growth under control. Cabbage worms can also be prevented and controlled by using row cover or insect netting when sowing or transplanting. Flea beetles. Small beetles that are either black, a blue color, bronze, gray, or sometimes striped. Flea beetles jump when they're disturbed, and they also shimmer in the light. Flea beetles feed on leaves and seedlings, and the damage from their feeding habits can stunt a plant's growth, reduce yields, spread diseases, or kill seedlings off entirely. Young plants are especially vulnerable while older plants can survive an infestation much better. Here's what to do. Use a lightweight floating row cover at the beginning of the season to prevent flea beetles from becoming an issue. There's also a homemade spray that uses two cups of rubbing alcohol, five cups of water, and one tablespoon of liquid soap that can work to repel these bugs. Test out this mixture on a single leaf first let it sit overnight, then spray the rest of the plant if there aren't any side effects. Dusting plants with plain talcum powder can also help, as well as using white sticky traps to capture these pests as they jump. As well, weeds attract and shelter flea beetles, so it's important to keep weed growth under control. Insecticides might help for about a week, but they'll need to be reapplied and adding a layer of mulch is yet another option. Be sure to practice crop rotation and plant seeds early to give them lots of time to establish themselves before the beetles become a problem. Mature plants are less susceptible to damage, so make sure to protect more vulnerable seedlings. Alternaria leaf blight. This fungus loves warm and wet conditions, causing brown spots with yellow edges to appear on the leaves, usually the oldest leaves first of a crop. The center of these lesions will also develop gray to brown soft fungal mold, eventually drying out and giving leaves a shot hole appearance. As the disease progresses, leaves will begin to curl and eventually will die and drop from the plant. This disease is common in growing areas with high temperatures and frequent rainfall. Here's what to do. Plant certified disease resistant seeds when possible and water plants from below to avoid having soil splash up onto the lower leaves of the plants. It's also helpful to water plants in the morning so that they have time to dry out during the day. In addition to watering plants from below, it's also helpful to provide a well-ventilated cover for the plants to protect the plants from rain. Be sure to clean any equipment between uses to prevent the spread of bacteria. And do not prune or handle plants when those plants are wet. As well, establish a crop rotation and stick to it. If there are any blighty leaves present, usually on the bottom of the plant closest to the soil, remove and destroy them. Finally, plant leaves can be sprayed with a baking soda solution, one tablespoon baking soda, 2.5 tablespoons of vegetable oil, and one teaspoon of liquid soap to one gallon of water, or neem oil. 
just take care not to use neem oil when pollinating insects, like bees or other beneficial insects, are present. Spray only a few leaves to start, then check for a reaction before applying every two weeks. Black leg. This disease starts as light lesions on the stem of a plant, which then turn brown with a black border and become sunken. During certain weather conditions, those lesions might be covered in pink masses. As well, the lesions can also go below the soil and attack the plant's roots. Black leg can affect plants at any stage of their growth, from seedling to maturity, and typically this disease causes wilting and plant death. Here's what to do. Practice a four-year crop rotation to help prevent this disease. Also, promote good air circulation by spacing plants apart properly, and make sure that the soil beneath the plants has good drainage. Finally, control weed growth around crops and avoid working in wet fields. Black rot. A soil or seed-borne bacteria that causes distinct lesions to form around the outsides of leaves. These lesions turn yellow slash orange and travel inward on the infected leaves, typically in a V shape. As well, these lesions might come together and give plants a scorched appearance. Leaf veins will then turn dark, and the stems of the plant might become discolored as well, with some dark rings on them. Leaves might wilt, dry out, and drop, and plants can eventually die. Black rot can happen at any stage of the growth process and can be spread by splashing water, equipment, wind, people, or insects. The disease typically emerges in moist, warm conditions. Here's what to do. Plant disease-free seeds or resistant varieties when possible, but before planting, soak the seeds in 122 degree Fahrenheit water for about 25 minutes to kill any lingering bacteria. Keep in mind that soaking seeds this way isn't 100% effective against black rot and might actually lower the seeds germination rate. As well, practice a two-year crop rotation and only use clean, sanitized tools near any crops. Wash tools with a diluted bleach mixture, about one part bleach to 10 parts water. Then rinse with cool water and towel dry after each use. It's important to control the growth of weeds and to follow the recommended plant spacing to increase airflow around plants, while also allowing plants to dry their leaves quicker. Be sure to remove and destroy any infected plants and avoid overhead watering. Club root. This fungus lives in the soil and causes deformed roots and those affected roots are then unable to absorb water and nutrients for the plant. Club root can actually remain in the soil for as long as 10 to 20 years under the right conditions, and this disease is typically more common in acidic soils. Unfortunately, club root can already be well established before any symptoms are visible above the soil. Here's what to do. Once club root is present in the soil, it can survive for many years, up to 20. So it's hard to completely get rid of it from the soil. If club root is present, it can help to solarize the soil. To do so, simply leave a clear plastic tarp on the soil surface for four to six weeks during the hottest part of the year. That tarp will trap the heat of the sun which will help to reduce the presence of club root. As well, plant resistant varieties when possible. Keep a clean garden and rotate crops properly. For club root, a five to seven year crop rotation is best. Carefully remove any infected plants and sterilize garden tools, one part bleach to four parts water after use. It can also work to try raising the soil's pH to a more alkaline 7.2 by mixing oyster shell or dolomite lime into the soil in the fall. Make sure soil is well draining too. Try to maintain high levels of calcium and magnesium in the soil, and don't move any infested soil into healthy areas. Damping off. 
This is one of the most common problems when starting plants from seed. Seedlings will emerge and appear healthy. Then suddenly, they'll wilt and die for no obvious reason. Damping off is caused by a fungus that thrives in moist conditions and when soil and air temperatures are above 68 degrees Fahrenheit. It can also thrive when soils have too much nitrogen fertilizer. This fungus favors slow-growing, deeply seeded plants. The stems of affected plants become water-soaked and will eventually collapse, while roots become too water-soaked and damaged to function. Older plants can also be affected, and either those older plants become stunted or they will collapse. Damping off can be spread three different ways, either in water, by contaminated soil, or on gardening equipment. Here's what to do. When possible, plant disease-free seeds. Keep seedlings moist, but avoid overwatering the seedlings to keep the soil from getting too wet and try to keep the soil from getting too cold. Raised beds are usually a great option for planting, since raised beds help with drainage. Also, avoid over-fertilizing seedlings, and thin the seedlings out to avoid overcrowding, and to make sure the seedlings are getting good air circulation. If containers are being used, those containers should be thoroughly washed in soapy water and then rinsed in a 10% bleach solution after each use. If any plants are affected with damping off, remove them from the garden and then practice a crop rotation of two to three years. Harvesting. Plants are ready to harvest once the cauliflower is about six to 12 inches, 15 to 30 centimeters in diameter. To harvest the crop, Simply cut the main stem at soil level, leaving some leaves attached to protect the white head during handling and storage. The heads become ricey when they're overmatured, so don't leave them in the ground for too long. Storage. Either use the cauliflower right away or break it up into chunks, store in plastic bags, then freeze them. Cauliflower can be stored at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, 0 degrees Celsius, for about one to two weeks. 